OK, so uh, can everybody hear me well also in the back? Yeah, loud enough? Good. Uh, so uh, hello, everybody. My name is Loris Kroh. I work at the Zig Software Foundation. Um, I would assume that um, you kind of have a, at least a vague idea of what Zig is, uh, since you are at a Zig meetup. Or at the very least, that you know, given the title of this presentation, like uh, what can systems programming give to distributed systems, you probably kind of know, should have guessed that Zig is a pro systems programming language, or at least a low level one. Um, in this talk, I want to basically explain, um, I, I basically want to argue the point that you should be interested in systems programming or lower level programming a little bit, even if your job is uh, working on like building network services. I know that it's a point that I need some arguments, so that's what I'll hope to do with the with the presentation. Um, and okay, so now I work at the Z Software Foundation, but before that, I worked for a while um, in, for a consultancy company, and I did enterprise software development. I did network services. Um, I didn't do it for a very long time, but I did it for long enough to have opinions about certain things. Uh, one of which was this. Uh, I wrote a blog post about stand-ups, the good, the bad, and the ugly stand-up, which I'm guessing most, if not all of you, uh, probably have to do every morning, or close enough. Um, it got retweeted by Jira. You decide if that should, con that should be <laughs> in my favor or if it should be held against me. It's up to you, but yeah, that's, that's the case. In any case, um, so I mentioned that, uh, yeah, I did this enterprise software development job and I learned a lot of things, but it wasn't exactly the best job ever. And, um, and I remember at the time uh, being kind of dissatisfied with it. Well, like my daily routine was something like uh, wake up five minutes before stand up, <laughs> do the stand up. Uh, how long is a stand up supposed to last? 10 minutes? Yeah, at 10 o'clock, <laughs> stand up finishes on the good days, go for a coffee break. Oh, well, coffee break ends, but some manager has some new user stories that should definitely go into the sprint because it, it's a thing about priorities, which you don't get. Um, fine. Lunch time. Uh, lunch is over. You know what? Let's watch some YouTube and Twitch. Um, uh, that's me. I'm sure none of you has ever done anything remotely like that. Um, Four o'clock, you know what, maybe it's time to start working on something. Oh, but wait, guess what? The architect comes in and, oh, we're doing event sourcing now. So uh, whatever you were doing is crapped. Uh, so you know what, I'm gonna go back what, to watch YouTube. Day ends, nothing of value was accomplished. Of course, the architect couldn't really come in every day and announce uh, event sourcing. That can only, be, can only happen more or less once or twice, uh, but, that, that's just to give you an idea. Um, so I wasn't super happy, especially about the last point. I was annoyed at the fact that I had to do things that were kind of meaningless because things, nobody knew what needed to be done. Things got scrapped. Um, things kept changing. Oh, we need to do Angular. No, actually it's React. No, actually it's Flutter. Um, so at some point I started asking, okay, how can I get to a in a work environment where, man, things are just, just a little bit better. Um, and the answer is that, well, um, I don't think there is a, obviously there is no silver bullet, but certainly getting better at what you do, being a better engineer, can help you get to better places. And uh, no work is perfect, obviously, being able to make things better where you are is part of your uh, skill set, is part of what you should be doing. But obviously, there has to be a balance uh, between things. Um, so uh, how do you get better? Well, at least in the bubble that I was in, and maybe it could be different for you. I don't know. But I think it wasn't just me. Getting better means that you definitely should know how to do event sourcing. And you definitely should know how to do Kubernetes and know everything about service mesh. And man, don't you have an opinion about distributed transactions? Should it be uh, two-phase commit or sagas? I hope you're not thinking of the wrong one. Um, and also domain-driven design, that's also very important. Uh, does anybody here 
uh, work at a place where you do DDD or like people have opinions about DDD. Oh my God, I see, okay, I see some hands. Uh, uh, <laughs> but to be fair, I'm, not, I'm actually not saying that all is bad. I, I don't think that, I actually don't think that DDD is bad. Uh, event sourcing is actually really useful when you're dealing with stuff like orders, and if you're doing event sourcing, then you better do CQRS, otherwise you don't have a materialized view to reply to queries. Uh, if you don't know what all this means, it's fine. But, but point being, like, these are not inherently bad things. But my point is that if this is all you think there is, if this is your universe of concepts, you're gonna plateau very quickly. Like you're gonna reach a point where you start plateauing um, for a bunch of reasons that I'm going to explain now in a moment. Um, to get better, in my opinion, it's not just a matter of like understanding the sublime nuance of what exactly is properly clean code like you so like the sommelier pours you some code and you say, mm, yeah, I can see some mm, nuts and some fruits and yeah, yeah, this is clean code. No, uh, you should think really of gaining a, what uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew Kelly, the creator of Zig, uh, recently defi defined in a, in a talk, a systems programming mindset, which I, the, the talk unfortunately is not published yet because a guy mm. holding all the recordings still needs to prepare them and publish them and the guy is me. But, <laughs> um, but to, to kind of try to sum up, summarize his, his entire talk in a sentence, this is how I describe it. A systems programming mindset is knowing in detail how the systems below you work so that you can make precise use of them to fully solve the use case at hand. Uh, and really, it makes a ton of difference when you have when you are in this position versus when just being a passenger on top of a crazy horse uh, that's going everywhere. Um, and the, real, the, the point is that if you gain a systems programming mindset, you actually end up having much, much better insight on the high level concepts, these guys, um, because you can evaluate much better what like, I, I don't know, I had some colleagues who had the strongest opinions about two-phase comet against sagas who didn't know how to make an item potent function. Like if you do not know how to make item potent stuff, you do not know how to do distributed transactions. As, just as a starting point. Um, and, and there's more, there's more. Uh, so I, after systems programming, uh, sorry, after enterprise software development, I be, worked for, as a developer advocate and I started learning about marketing in tech. And uh, you developers like to think that they are immune to marketing and that's what makes them extremely easy to con. Um, now, I'm not saying that what I do, what I write is exactly trying to con people, but uh, I mean, people are gillable. And software engineers are gillable, way more than they think they are. In, in any case, you, you, you decide how much what I'm saying is actually true or just random boasting, but if you, were look, if you were reading Hacker News on Monday, that's my blog post at the top of it that shows Zig to a bunch of people. Um, another example, uh, Bun. Uh, Bun is a JavaScript runtime. You might have heard of it. It's like made kind of the, the news uh, recently because it's pretty fast and uh, people find it surprisingly fast compared to other people. And according to them, if you look on, on the website front page, oh my God, look at this bar chart. There are no axes, but who needs them? Uh, Ban, huge, no JS, blah, Dino, uh, Okay, so uh, out of curiosity, raise your hand. How many of you, has any of you tried Ban? Can you raise your hand if you tried Ban? Okay, keep your hand up. Uh, keep it up if you think, if, you, if your impression when using it was that it was really fast for real. No, one, okay, one hand is up. By the way, I have no opinion. I didn't try Ban. Um, <laughs> but my point, my point is, obviously, you can, you can have your own personal experience when you try stuff, but they're telling you this. Man, Dino, so embarrassing. But wait a minute. Oh, no, what's this? That's a talk by Dino at a conference. Let's zoom on the bar graph. Oh, shit. Dino, huge throughput. Dino, very low memory usage. Hmm, something is afoot. Who's right here? The answer is, like, you can't tell. If you don't know how this, if you don't know how a JavaScript engine is implemented, if you don't know the low level stuff, you have, you have literally, you do not have the, the tools to be able to evaluate these claims. Sure, you can test things, you can try things on your own, but every, 
And every test that you run is, is limited in a sense. It would be much nicer, you know, as an engineer, if you actually had precise knowledge to evaluate all this stuff. Um, so, and, and then stuff like this happens. Dino versus ban <coughs> performance is rigged. Like people start these blog posts. And uh, it's not just Dino and ban. Like there's uh, something similar about a lot of other technologies. Is, is Kafka fast or is Kafka slow? Is Mongo web scale? Is it truly web scale? These are all interesting questions, no? Um, and then you have, um, <coughs> you have these people push out blog posts that explain, that tell you how you should be reasoning about software engineering. Here I picked up to, uh, I selected two blog posts from Dino, uh, which I found particularly funny because they both are about the, the, the future of the web. And the future of the web is both the edge and server-side rendering, which is, I guess, not necessarily at odds. I just find funny that they reutilize the same concept twice. Um, but then again, so according to them, you really should be putting stuff on the edge. Uh, out of curiosity, is anybody here in, your com uh, like here in your company doing stuff on the edge? I see hands. Wow, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, and I, I frankly do not know if this is wrong or, 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 or not. And as usual, right, nothing is in inherently entirely wrong or not. But the point is that they tell you that you should definitely put stuff on the edge and you should definitely do server side rendering. Why? And this is Dino, but by the way, BAN is no different. Why? Uh, because they got venture capital and they can't sell you BAN. They can't sell you Dino because these are open source projects. What, the only thing that they can sell you is their uh, hosting services, is their BAN as a service, is their Dino as a service. So in, in a sense, and they're not even really, even really evil. Like what, what can they tell you? Right, uh, I'll say something not about Delivery Hero. Uh, we, we have another similar um, service in Italy called Just Eat. Their actual tagline is, don't cook, just eat. And it's like, I mean, that, yeah, that's what they sell. What, what, are, what are they supposed to tell you, right? Other than just cook, don't eat. That, that's their job. They should, they can, you can't expect them to be teaching you recipes to make at home. <laughs> this is, makes no sense. So by the, from these people, you're only going to hear how to put stuff on the edge, how to buy their services. So let's go back to this concept cloud. Of course, one way of gaining contents over these things is to read other people's opinions, blog posts, and stuff. But guess what? Behind each of these technologies, or each of these ideas, there are companies. Event sourcing, Kafka, caching. I used to work at Redis Labs, so that, that was my jam. Message queues, it's RabbitMQ, better or worse than NATS or the other 10,000 alternatives. <laughs> so so the, 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 my point is, a good chunk of the stuff that you're being fed is produced by companies who got investments and all they can do is tell you to use their stuff. So is this gonna lead you to do good engineering or not? The answer is you can't know if you don't know anything about lower level programming. You have no way of knowing. You cannot form an uh, informed opinion. So this brings me finally to the actual talk. Uh, I'm, like, I'm almost done, don't worry. <laughs> so what can systems programming offer to distributed systems? Uh, Number one, performance. And uh, Adam already spoke about this uh, at PyCon DE. Speaking of Python with Zig, I think that like, the, you should watch the talk. It's nice. And the, the, to sum it up, um, Delivery Hero has to parse a bunch of YAML. Python YAML slow, Zig YAML fast. Put Zig YAML parser in Python YAML parser, Python YAML parser fast. <laughs> no, but, no, but he, he shows how to actually do it. Like, he shows actual code. Um, so you should watch it. But, uh, okay, so this one is easy. Obviously, I'm, I'm sure everybody here, I haven't surprised anybody with this point. Fair. And to be fair, if this was it, like, if all you could gain from, systems program, from a systems programming mindset and some systems programming knowledge was better performance, I actually would not be giving this talk. There are some more interesting points. The next one might be more spicy, you, and you might disagree. Uh, maintainability. I think you can get better maintainability by learning some systems programming. And I'll bring up one example by, boom, these guys, Uber. So uh, I don't know all the details. I don't know what Uber does, but like, they have this hexagonal thing where they said they, they do geolocalization stuff, and they said, you know what? 
we think that using hexagons to tile uh, the planet is better than using a normal grid. It's a lie because they also use pentagons and they don't put that in name, but setting aside all this detail, uh, this, this tiny stuff, um, fine, it, it's, a, it's a cool solution, okay, they have this thing. Obviously they have to use this thing in a bunch of places, right, on mobile phones, uh, web browser, like web pages, backend stuff, I don't know. So what did they do? Did they write one implementation for each language? No, they wrote it once in C, you can see it here, 93.3% C, and then they bind it to a bunch of other services. Like they didn't have an SQLite 3 module, which means that they have the data type in SQLite. So they, they created the data type, which is pretty cool. You can do the same with Redis, Postgres, and a bunch of other things, which I, it's really cool. That's one actual cool thing that I did in my old enterprise um, job. Number three, reliability. Uh, Here's an interesting idea. So these people wrote a database in Zig called Tiger Beetle. Tiger Beetle is a financial database. So it's a special purpose database. And that's a key ingredient. That, like, it's an important premise for what they are able to accomplish. What Tiger Beetle does is, sorry, what Tiger Beetle does is once it starts up, it allocates some memory. After this initial allocation is done, it never allocates any more memory ever as long as it keeps running. That's, it allocates like about four gigs of RAM. So it's, it's not like cheap, but that, that's it. It's four gigs, period. Um, this is a database that cannot run out of memory. Um, why, uh, why I think this is interesting? Because when you are running stuff like on, you chuck your programs, like your services on Kubernetes uh, and other orchestrators, they have to decide how many instances of things put on, on, on nodes and you need to give it an estimate of how much memory you use. But the reality is that if your program allocates memory dynamically, the amount of memory that you use, it's actually variable. So you have to basically find a balance between not wasting too much memory, but also if, you, if you're too uh, stingy, what happens is that a program tends to allocate memory, it can't allocate memory, and most of the time what happens is that the OS kills it. Like our uh, programs that, run, uh, that try to allocate memory when there's none available get killed by the OS normally. Uh, that sucks. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Kubernetes kills it. Kubernetes makes, uh, makes another one. But still, the in-flight requests are all dead, and that sucks. It's nice when things are uh, behave much more predictably from, uh, predicti predictably from a memory perspective. And I think this is available for network services. Although, to be fair, I understand if you say, well, I don't think my employer is worth that much effort. Fine, fair. <laughs> but, but it is, I think, as somebody who loves the craft, something that is maybe worth pursuing. Maybe, maybe it might sound too hard, but I'll tell you, memory, manual memory management is not as hard as people make it out to be if you know how to make it easy for you. Um, but m more in general, it's not the 90s anymore. There's not only C or C++ anymore, which really makes a difference. Uh, this is uh, Yoran, the creator and now CEO of uh, Tiger Beetle, and he says, uh, Zig is the charm, Tiger Beetle wouldn't be what it is without it, Com time has been a game changer for us, and the shared philosophy around explicitness and memory efficiency has made everything easier. It's been working with the grain. The standard library is pleasant, I've learned so much from the community. So the point is that like, things are changing, like the equation is uh, slightly changing, uh, which brings me to a fourth bonus point, uh, freedom. If you learn a little bit of systems programming, you gain freedom from all your, like you know when you have this dependency that you can't swap out for another one and it's janky, but you don't know how to fix it. And that, that's horrible, like you're, like you're basically hostage of that thing. But then you try to open it, oh no, it's C, I don't understand C, uh, and which, which is understandable, or it's C++ and then you can throw everything away. Um, <laughs> but things are changing, things are changing. And if you, if, you, if you change your mindset from, oh, I'm a web dev, I'm a full stack dev, as in I'm a backend plus I can look at HTML without barfing up. Um, if you change from that perspective to, no, I'm more than that, I'm also an engineer, like I'm a, I'm a full engineer, not a full stack engineer, a full engineer, um, you can gain some freedom. And which also can reflect in uh, better freedom when uh, searching for a job. Um, final point, which is, I was kind of hinting at earlier, I also 
uh, evaluated the idea of learning more about systems programming in the past. I technically am a bioinformatician from when it, come to, when it comes to my education in university, and I decided to learn uh, web shit. I decided to learn how to do web stuff because it was smarter, like <coughs> easier for the job. It was turned out to be a good decision. And then I had to evaluate, should I also learn systems programming stuff? And like, there's a universe of disgusting stuff out there. And I said, you know what? I don't think I'll get enough. There's way too much friction. I don't think I'll get enough given the upfront cost of doing that. But the equation is changing. Uh, and it doesn't have to be Zig. Like Rust is another example. And there's also other languages that are all uh, kind of giving you solutions to so, th so that you don't have to deal with like 40 years of uh, accidents of history or things that maybe used to be fine in the past that are not anymore. Like these new languages are really changing the equation and uh, you might want to evaluate, reevaluate your perception in that regard. And that's really it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Are you willing to accept some Q and A? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. You you decide as. as yeah, yeah. Well. Does anybody have? Okay. We ha also have a microphone to right, record right. the yeah, questions. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, like, raise your hand if you have yeah. one, and Jacob will come to you. I. I oh, okay. Oh, we have <laughs> we have a few. Okay. Hey, does it work? Uh, yeah, really but right. there's no. It's just for the recording. Okay, okay, sorry. Right. So you have to uh, speak up anyway. So. Um, how do you make sure that we are not living in a bubble? So we are all interested in systems programming, but how do yeah. I convince my boss to not use the next Node.js library instead of thinking about what I'm actually doing? You. That, that's a good question. That's a really good question. So um, it's tough. There are some other communities like the Handmade Network who care about performance. Uh, maybe you have seen a recent video from Casey Muratori, uh, clean code, comma, horrible performance. Um, these people have their own take on, on uh, what should maybe change from modern development. The, rea the real answer is that as long as you're just a software engineer, you are a victim of whatever the market throws at you from that perspective. The real, real change can happen only when people get an entrepreneurial mindset and basically um, punch in the face their old boss, figuratively speaking, with a better product. The idea is people do it not in the right way. You do it in the better way. You kick them out of the market. Obviously, you can't do that as just a software engineer. You have to be an entrepreneur. So I'm not, and I'm not, say, I'm not suggesting you have to do it today, but that's the actual answer. The reality is that I think by gaining a better, uh, gaining as col collectively better understanding of these things makes us more, more, maybe not immune, but at least better protected against shitty marketing because there's a ton of shitty marketing in software engineering. Uh, I work for database companies. It's a mess. It's really a mess. Um, and, uh, and it's a slow and painful process. But I think that as long as people are interested in this stuff, things will get better over time. That's the actual answer. And also, the better you are, and the more you, picky, the more you care about this stuff, and, and, and if you play your cards well and find a job that actually cares about doing things well, Again, market forces will hopefully move us in the right direction. Maybe. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, there was one here? No. Hi. Uh, yeah, you have to speak up. Would you recommend uh, any book regarding system programming? <sighs> that is another very good question. Yeah, where do you learn systems programming? So that's tough. So the problem with all systems programming book, in my experience, I haven't read all of them, so I, I cannot, I'm not coming to you with like an encyclopedic understanding and knowledge of, uh, of the literature, but based on what I've seen, all books have the problem that basically they mix up C-isms with actual important concepts. They cannot distinguish what is the one stupid thing that C did in the 80s, which it's, it's a C only thing, 
with, with things that actually have stood the test of time, like, I don't know, virtual memory or stocks that are not a C thing. They are like kind of much more universal. Um, so old books, they suck from that perspective. Um, new books, maybe some of the Rust literature could be nice if you like Rust. I don't like Rust because to me it's like a too it smells too much like C++, too much complexity. So for me, that doesn't work. Um, if you are interested in Zig, uh, like if you, if you end up kind of liking the Zig philosophy, we don't have a book yet, but we do have, uh, we have, for example, Zig.news, which is like a blog aggregator with blog posts about concept, like a bunch of concepts that, um, uh, systems programming concepts. And we have very, very good uh, help channels. You join the Discord community, there's the Zig help channel that has always like a f about 100 topics going on in parallel with people asking for help and getting answers where people can actually teach you like um, things that are not obvious like how do I know the size of my terminal window like uh, how do I get access to that knowledge um, that's an API that, pe that people who haven't never done lower level programming might not be aware of and people would always be willing to help you out so uh, long story short we are I think at the stage of uh, Man, what, how do you say that in English? When people wouldn't write <coughs> things, but they would just say things by voice. Like they, they would, word of mouth. yeah, word of mouth. But like in the past, oh my God, there's a name for that age. The age before the written word, I guess. <laughs> I, think, I think that we are at that stage right now. We need to work our way forward towards the Bronze Age or something. You mean the offline age? The? The offline age. Offline? No, more like, the, you know, like in, in prehistoric times when people what would... Yeah, folk history, like, like, yeah, yeah, something like that. Like, yeah, we, we are like in a prehistoric state when it comes to this stuff right now. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but we are gearing up uh, you know, in the Z community with like better sources of information for systems programming when it comes to Z. It just takes time, it's just a young language. I think there was maybe a, Okay, there's one there. I think there was also one down there, maybe. Uh, remember to speak up, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't keep it to hold this, right? Yes. <laughs> right, so if I recall correctly, you mentioned that you worked at the database company, right? I did. Right, and did it have like a clause about benchmarking, like a Oracle-like clause, you know, to allow to publish the benchmarks? Sorry, did they have yeah. what about benchmarking? Uh, benchmarking clause in the contract. If you buy a database, you can publish benchmarks with prior approval of the company. That's a good question. I don't know. Right, so for the question, actually, I think uh, that is like a, at least database companies have this proliferation of clauses against benchmarking, yeah. uh, mainly led by Oracle. So do you think that they like bring this parallel back to the JavaScript runtimes? <laughs> a good benchmark would be like uh, enough to let's say make allow the software engineers to make better decisions so in other way the problem is not like about having more data but like a better benchmarks to show mm -hmm. where each like runtime is better at yeah i don't know i think that M my impression when it came to databases, and I feel like it's 100% the same also with like um, JavaScript runtimes, is that the target audience has no way of knowing if what you're saying is true or not. Or rather, you can torture your benchmark just enough to corroborate whatever claim you want because you have to show high level claims and people in your target audience has no way like it, it, uh, the, the funny thing is that if they were to sh do like more precise benchmarks of like i don't know showing you how many cycles they employ to do syscalls it's not even that interesting but just as an example the, the problem is that your audience like your average javascript programmer doesn't know how to evaluate cycles doesn't know exactly when syscalls happen and how they happen. They have a vague understanding. I'm, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm not dissing uh, JavaScript developers. I, I come from a high level programming background and I'm learning this stuff as I go. Uh, but the reality is that if you don't have precise knowledge over that, then a, any precise benchmark will be way less impactful to you than the holy shit, look at this huge bar. 
uh, that people put on the front page. So I think nothing good will come from that. <laughs> no matter what happens, I, I think that given given how the uh, the um, the cards are laid out on the table, uh, people will keep pushing out stupid benchmarks, and other people will keep gobbling them up happily. No matter what else happens uh, on the sides. No more questions? Oh, one. Um, I will never forget the day when uh, Linus Torvalds announced that Rust will be accepted in the Linux uh, kernel. Yeah. Are there any talks, or is Linus Torvalds even aware of that Zig Zig exists and is there a goal that this is also being accepted in the future in the Linux kernel, or are we too early or, uh, already or still? Mm. Um, so I don't know for sure if Linux has any idea that Zig exists. I, he probably is vaguely aware of it. Uh, just a random guess. Uh, I, I can give you another interesting example. Um, uh, the creator of Ruby, I think he, I'm, I might mis mispronounce this uh, horribly, but I think it's Yukihiro uh, Mats. Um, he is aware of Zig, and they were, uh, uh, they, uh, I think the story is that they wanted to write a uh, JIT system for Ruby, but they, or at least they had one, but it was originally written in C, but in any case, they didn't, whatever the original conditions were, they didn't want to, to have more C, so they said, we want to use something new, and we are evaluating like Rust and Zig and everything else, and they decided to go with Rust, the people doing the work, but there's like this uh, exchange in the mailing list, or, or no, on the Ruby forum, uh, where the creator says, you know what, I, I personally have a preference for Zig, uh, but since you guys are gonna do the ones doing the job, you, you decide what you want to use. So that's a situation, for example, where somebody famous uh, knows about Zig. OK, is there any plans from our perspective to like get Zig in the kernel or anything? The answer is, God, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because uh, I would have to be probably the one who has to interact with this stuff. I will not do it. I, I'm never going to do it. And I think more in general, it's against our philosophy. I don't care. The, the Linux developers want Zig in there. Awesome. Have fun. They don't want it. Fine. Use whatever you like. I really do not care at all. Or rather, obviously, it's not like I would be unhappy if they chose to use Zig. Um, but, but in the Zig Software Foundation, we don't have this attitude where we need to push Zig on people. Like, do whatever you want. Uh, there's we there's some value that we think is there in Zig. So, like, I'm here and I'm telling you about Zig. We are organizing a meetup. Um, but there's, there's no moral imperative to use Zig. Like there might, some might feel there is in using Rust. And uh, more in general, we're, we don't really have much to gain. Like the reality is that the Zig process, also today Zig is kind of uh, unstable. Let, okay, let's say that tomorrow Linux says, you know what? I'm gonna kick out Rust and pull in Zig if they stabilize it by next year. We're not gonna do it. We have our own schedule. We're not on a rush. We're not Ban versus Dino, where now we have to race to whoever takes it all and kills the other guy. Because I mean, they, they, their business model kind of only works if they are the top dog. No, uh, we're gonna take our time. We're gonna try stuff out. We're gonna change the language for a while more. We're gonna, the, the, the blog post on Hacker News that I was showing earlier, it's like new for loop syntax, it's pretty cool. Huge breaking change. Uh, I think uh, almost, maybe not every, but good amount of projects that were written in Zig now will need, need to have a new, a, a tiny change in, in the syntax. So that's our schedule. That's what we're sticking with. Um, the, the amount of insane lobbying required to fight against people who want at any cost rust in the kernel, uh, no matter what, I'll tell you, like from a human perspective, you're never gonna see me do that. <laughs> I, I don't want to. <laughs> and we're like four people in the Z Software Foundation. So Jacob, do you want to do that? 
<laughs> he doesn't care. So, <laughs> that's, so that, that, that's two. A Andrew wants to write Zig instead of lobbying. Uh, the other guy, Veika, he's, he's Finnish, and he definitely likes coding more than uh, lobbying. So <laughs> it's not going to happen. We're not that kind of people. That's the reality. I, any more questions? Otherwise, I think we're good. Oh, there's one. Let's go. Yeah, as continuation uh, to question to benchmarks, you yeah. mentioned uh, some benchmarks regarding uh, BAN versus DENA, right? Yeah. But maybe you uh, can show some benchmarks uh, Zeek versus Rust or Zeek versus other language. Mm -hmm. do, do you have something like that? Hmm. I have a tweet about this. I'm, I'm wondering Wait. if I should pull it up. I have a question to a question. What kind of a benchmark? Yeah, Com yeah, yeah. You, you answer this question. I'm going to pull it up. You Okay, so <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound, I, I, okay, I, I don't want to be too disagreeable. Uh, this is just a random angry tweet. That, that's what I do on Twitter. Um, but I'll, I'll, give you an, I'll give you, I think, a good answer to your question. So benchmarking Rust versus Zig. Benchmarking Rust versus Zig is, for the most part, pointless. Because the reality is that they are both uh, low-level programming languages, they can both, you can make both produce almost whatever type of machine code you want. And if you care about machine code to the level where, no, actually, this type of machine code doesn't work with Rust, then you want to write assembly directly anyway. So um, they are very close. Um, the the, the a optimized build of a program in, of the equivalent program in Rust and Zig is going to be always able to do the exact same. What, ch what matters, what, what is the, uh, the, the difference, is how easy it is to reach that quote unquote ideal program. And each language has its own take. Uh, Rust, roughly speaking, has the uh, attitude where you reach good programs by building abstractions. And these abstractions are all zero cost abstractions where in an optimized build, all the abstractions kind of operate, like they don't cause runtime overload. Zig has a different approach. Zig says, no, you don't build a ton of abstractions. You keep things simple, uh, which sometimes works better, sometimes works worse. Like you can find use cases where one language shines more than the other, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but then at the end of the day, it's a matter of also your own uh, preferences. and. Uh, when, it comes, when it comes to differences, the, the actual differences are the ones that do not require benchmarks. The differences are that Rust takes forever to compile because your zero cost abstractions are zero cost when you're doing an optimized build. Uh, if you're doing a debug build, or more in general, the compiler has to go through a ton of, of code that you've wrote or a ton of metaprogramming and stuff, which in Zig you normally wouldn't find as much. So, for example, Zig wins in terms of compiler speed. On the other hand, though, the Rust compiler, it's pretty cool. It has the borrow checker. It catches a ton of errors. We don't have that. So long story short, the, diff like, if you're, the question whether you make faster executables with Rust or Zig, you can make fast executables with both. There is no real difference from that angle. What matters is which of the two programming styles you are more productive in, and other things about the tooling. Rust is a more mature language. Like if you use Rust, I think it's Rust Analyzer, like the, the, the Rust LSP stuff, it's much more complete than the Zig one because we're just getting started and breaking the language every other week. So that also doesn't help, I guess. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, Zig is moving forward. Things will get better. If you like what Zig offers, 
uh, then maybe you're willing to put up with some breakage in, in the meantime. And I think there's a, like, there's a ton of things like this between Zig and Rust. So I would say the benchmarks, at the end of the day, are really not that important. When, if you want Zig versus other languages, I don't know, Python, slower. Um, <laughs> big surprise. <laughs> But really, when it comes to uh, like when it comes to comparing languages in the same ballpark, like Zig, Rust, C, C++, they're all the same, except that the C++ like stuff written in C++ is always a pile of garbage, so it's always it's, like it's bloated and slow. But it's, but it's not the language itself. In theory, you could write the actual good version. It's just that it's a mess. But to evaluate that, you don't evaluate that through a benchmark. You evaluate that through experience. That's it. We're good. Uh, end the questions there so that we can cool. get behind schedule. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>